Who recalls that we are looking at that uh, great passage, a great book in the Bible that you read every day because you just gain so much from it. 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. Now, if you may recall, uh, when we looked at it, that we looked through the whole of chapters 1 to 9. You was grateful I didn't read the entire chapters from 1 to 9. But we looked at it in the concept that the genealogies were showing that, um, you know, that w- w- what the, the author or chron- the chronicler, because it wasn't just one author, it's multiple, was trying to show the rich heritage that the Israelites came from. They've returned from exile. The glory days of King David are centuries old. And they need to know that they've actually come from this rich heritage. Do you remember I said in a family tree, we tend to start with us and work our way back. But actually the chronicler was starting with Adam and working his way forward and trying to show us or show the Israelites that they have this rich heritage. And then also that we recognise that within ourselves through Jesus Christ, we also have this fantastic heritage. So, as we go through Chronicles, as I've explained, we're going to take this in each chapter in large chunks. We're not going to sort of focus on, um, you know, half a chapter a week. If we did that, Jesus might return before we finish. So we're going to take this in large chunks as we unpack it. So, and you may recall that I said that one and two chronicles are actually in reality all one big book. Great bedtime reading, especially if you suffer from insomnia. But the core of these books was to focus on King David and King Solomon, sort of the glory days. And the Chronicle was telling history from a viewpoint, wanting to preach a sermon rather than giving exacting imagery. He wants to sort of preach a sermon to try and get you to see who you are. So do you remember I said, you know, it's like an argument, isn't it? If two people have an argument, remember Carol said her and Frank never argue. So, see, I remembered this two weeks on, Carol. Um, But, you know, always when you look at an argument, it's fascinating how if I had two of you in the room, you would might as well have been on two different planets because your retelling of the story will show more favour in your light than it does in the other person, yeah? No, I didn't say that. They struck the first words. Did they really? In reality, no, they probably didn't. But the chronicler here is trying to show us stuff by in the way that he's omitting things. And as we go through, you'll see that he's... Other stories in 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Samuels will say, well, why didn't he mention that in here? Well, because he's trying to show a core message, and that's the point. So we'll keep going. So let's look at chapter 10 briefly, incredibly briefly. And it's around King Saul, the first sort of king of Israel, of the Jewish nation. And in Chronicles, he's all in one chapter. And the focus is in verse 13. You know, I'm not going to read the entire lot. I I would suggest do read it. It actually isn't that bad. It's quite exciting. There's there's little nuggets of gold in 1 Chronicles, little nuggets. And you suddenly go, wow, that's interesting. But in verse 13, this is why he's only in one chapter. It's, so Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He failed to obey the Lord's command, and he even consulted a medium instead of asking the Lord for guidance. So the Lord killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. You think, gosh, how bad Saul must have been. What has Saul done? Well, we need to look at some other places just to capture an idea of what Saul got up to. So I'm just going to flick around for a bit. It's not going to come up on the screen because it's just not possible in that way. But I'm going to look to 1 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 8 to 14, just to give you an idea. You up for this? 
Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel the prophet arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him, but Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me and you, wouldn't, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Mishmash, ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. You have to understand something. Saul should have just waited for Samuel. It's that simple. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Have you kept it? The Lord, had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Ouch. In 1 Samuel 14, it states, Now, the men of Israel were pressed to exhaustion because Saul had placed them under an oath, saying, Let a curse fall on anyone who eats before evening, before I have full revenge on my enemies. So no one ate anything all day, even though they had all found honeycomb on the ground in the forest. They didn't care, they didn't dare touch the honey because they all feared the oath they had taken. So imagine a king turning around to his people and saying, You're in a battle, don't eat anything until I've had revenge on my enemies. It's not very good for soldiers, is it, not be able to eat anything? A bit of a foolish remark. And actually, as you look all through this, Saul has this habit of making foolish remarks and foolish oaths and foolish promises. He has this habit of doing this. And what happens, his own son, Jonathan, actually takes some of this honey during the battle. And then, of course, clearly what then happens is, is that the Philistines start winning. And then Saul said... Um, then the Saul said to the leaders, something's wrong. I want all the army co commanders to come here. We must find out what sin has been committed today. I vow by the name of the Lord who rescued Israel that the sinner will surely die, even if it is my own son, Jonathan. Of course, it turns out it is Jonathan who sinned. And then he says, no, I'm going to kill you, my son, Jonathan. But I'm glad to say the people actually saved Jonathan and said, no, you can't do this. But this for me is where Saul's biggest failing against the Lord was. In chapter 15, it says this. The Lord has given Samuel, uh, sorry, given Saul a instruction by Samuel, via Samuel. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels and donkeys. It's not hard, is it? It's a fairly simple instruction. I'm not saying the carrying out the instruction is not difficult, but the point of wipe them all out. So Saul mobilized his army. There were 200,000 soldiers from Israel and 10,000 men from Judah. Then Saul and his army went down to the, the town of Amalekite and lay wait in the valley. Saul sent this warning to the Canaanites. Move away from where the Amalekites live or you will die with them. For you've shown kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Canaanites packed up and left. Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites. He captured Agat, the Amalekite king, and completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs. Everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Now, what did God ask him to do? 
Wipe the lot out. Now, you actually need to know something. This word destroyed, by the way, doesn't mean quite destroyed in the way that we understand it. It means devote to the Lord. It's an act of worship. This destroying is actually a devotion, an act of worship. So when they only destroyed the poor quality stuff, what they're doing is actually offering the worst of the stuff as an act of worship to God and keeping all the good stuff for themselves under Saul's instruction. So a bit later on, what happens is Samuel the prophet turns up and sees all these qualities. He says, what are you doing? And then Saul comes up with some rubbish. Well, we were keeping this to worship this for the Lord. No, they weren't. Originally, they were keeping it for themselves. So Saul really wasn't a man after God's own heart. He was seriously against the Lord. And actually, his other excuse, and I forgot that, so bear with me a moment. It's quite important here. When he is confronted... And I will get there. Apologies. Oh, I'll read it. But they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. And Samuel said to the Lord, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked? I don't know if you, about you. If somebody said, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. I'd be like, okay. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself... Are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel and now and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for plunder and do what is evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord. I carried out the mission he gave me. Then, then the troops brought back the best of the sheep, goats, cattle and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And then, of course, it's like, no, that is not. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worship idol, idol, as worshipping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And that's when we go into 1 Chronicles and then they pray, uh, they show that the Lord destroyed Saul because of his foolishness. Later on, Saul talks about the fact that actually he's more fearful of man. That's why he did these things. He's more worried about people and his own people. The reason he sacrificed because he sees his army fleeing. He's oh, don't have them flee. And the rules over keeping the fattened calf, the fattened food, the good food, I'm sure that's because everybody said, oh, well, let's keep this good stuff. We need this. And he was more worried about what people thought of him as a king than he was worried about keeping God's command. And to get offer to the Lord the worst of the stuff rather than keeping the best of the stuff, what does that say to us today? We should be offering the best to the Lord. Wonder how often we actually do offer the sort of the. Notice I said we. How much do we offer the seconds? And it's not always just financial offering, it's offering of our time, offering of our very hearts. Oh, yes, I'll go and do that thing that the church is doing. If I have time, as long as it works around my schedule. Yeah, because I've got the shopping to do, the dusting to do. Oh, no, it's not me, is it? Sorry. I've got the car to clean. No, I don't do that neither. But you can go for a whole list of stuff that you say that's priority and that overrides everything else before I do what the Lord is asking me to do. So we have to think about that. Something to reflect on. Right, found that bit miserable. Let's now look cheerfully at somebody who was known after of God's own heart, okay? So let's go to David. 1 Chronicles, chapter 11. Now, 
wow, there's lots we could talk about David. One Chronicles, as far as I can make out at the moment, doesn't at all mention anything of David's transgressions. You know, Bathsheba. Bathsheba, you know, the affair. They don't seem to mention him arranging the death of Uriah, her husband. Making David look really, really good. Well, the point being is they're trying to show David in this whole of these chapters here that he is the founder of Jerusalem's temple worship. He, David is a worship leader and the founder of the focus on the temple. That's what they're trying to do here in Chronicles. When you read that, that's the core message. There is some other stuff underneath, but that is the core message. So David is becoming king of Israel, according to chapter 11. Is it busted? Oh, yes, it is. Sorry, you're right. Sorry, it's because it says at the bottom. Right. Then all Israel gathered before David at Hebron and told him, we are our own flesh and blood. In the past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord your God told you, you will be the shepherd of my people. You will be the leader of my people, Israel. All the people got around. The fractured tribes of Israel got around David. It's interesting, isn't it? Even though Saul was king, they recognised that David really led all the people. So the men are coming to respond to David. David was able to unify the people. And they have to go and capture a capital city. It says in verse... um, Verse 4 onwards, and the David, then David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, or Jabez as it used to be called, because the Jezubi, Jezba. Does anybody go and grab me a glass of water, please? I am getting dry of mouth. Thank you, Andy. Where the Jezubites, the original inhabitants of the land, were living, the people of Jabez taunted David, saying, you'll never get in here. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Anybody ever seen Monty Python and you will not pass? No, anyway, sorry. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David. David had said to his troops, whoever these first to attack the Jezubites will become the commander of my armies. And Joab, the son of David's sister, Zeriah, so his nephew basically, was first to attack. So he became the commander of David's army. So originally Jerusalem wasn't theirs and they went and captured it and took it. So it became their capital. I love the fact that You know, people got behind David and wanted to do what he wanted them to do. They got behind David and said, yes, you're our king and we're going to do what you want us to do. Unlike Saul, who they really didn't unify under because the man, I suppose, was weak. They could see that he was double minded all the time, that he wasn't fully on for the Lord. Thank you very much. But they got behind David instead. And then in chapter 11, could you just flick through a a couple of times to me, please, to about verse 10. There's nothing worse than trying to go through a hard chunk. Ah, that's it, yeah. These are the leaders of David's mighty warriors. Together with all Israel, they decided to make David their king, just as the Lord had promised concerning them. Mighty warriors, and then you get this whole list of mighty warriors. Here's their record. The first was um, Jehoshaphat, oh, the Hakamite who was the leader of the three. By the way, the three are David's closest three friends. And you get this great list in it. Please, I want you to read this. I'd love us to go through the whole lot, but you'll be bored if we did it here now. But really soak it up. For me, it's fantastic. I mean, he's the mightiest of the three. He once used his spear to kill 300 enemy warriors in a single battle. Oh! Wow! This is a mighty warrior, and he's one of David's mates. So imagine what he, the others could do behind him. And it just goes on about these mighty men. 
And there's this great reference uh, to all their mini exploits. And in verse 22, there's also Benaniah, son of Jedediah, a valiant warrior from Cabazil, who did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time on a snowy day, he chased the lion down into a pit and killed it. Do you know what? I love that. A snowy day. Do you know why it's mentioning it's a snowy day? They're trying to show the time of year it was. It means that the lion couldn't get, actually get a lot of food, so the lion was really hungry, so it was extra ferocious. You ever noticed? My cat, whenever he's hungry, he gets extra cuddly. <laughs> Not ferocious, he gets extra cuddly. But here, this lion would have been extra ferocious, so the whole point of all of this is, gosh, this lion, and yet he killed this beast. That's the point. So these are mighty warriors, and it just keeps going on and on and on about how great it has become with these mighty warriors. And then we get to uh, chapter 12, verse 16. We are leaping. And in between all of this, oh no, sorry, on 12, you go to 12 just for a minute. You get all these lists of warriors, it just goes on and on. And on. The following men joined uh, David at Zelak while he was hiding from Saul, son of Kish. One of the great things with this is it goes back in time as well to show even before David was king, these people got behind him. They recognised that he was God's next anointed. I think that's amazing. They saw the sign of the times and they got behind him. And all of them were expert archers and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hand as well as their right. They were ambidextrix. Is that the right word? Oh, that do. Anyway, who cares? And there was even ready for this, and this is the best bit. There were all relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Even Saul's own family ditched him as king and went to follow King David. And you know where Jesus talks about the fact that actually if you want to follow me, I've come to divide. Mother against daughter, father against son. If you don't love me more than you love others. Yeah? Jesus is priority. And that's where Saul's fault was at work. God was not his priority. For David, it's the other way. That's why people followed him. Because they could see that God was with him. Uh, verse 16. Thanks, Timmy. Others from Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. Benjamin, by the way, is Saul's tribe. David went out to meet them. If you've come in peace to help me, we are friends. But if you come to betray me to my enemies then I am, when I'm innocent, then may the God of our ancestors see it and punish you. It's actually quite important, so I just want to focus on this for a moment. These, these are Saul's family, so they've come to see King David, or David at this point. And of course, David's quite rightly saying, well, have you come here to be my friends, or have you come here to be my enemies? Have you come in peace, i.e., have you come in shalom? Have you come to be my friends? And that's really, really important. The NRSV actually reads this much better. If you have come to me in friendship to help me, then my heart will be knit to you. But if you come to betray me to my adversaries, though my hand have done no wrong, then may the God of our ancestors see and give judgment. And this is the point, my heart will knit to you. This heart knitting to you is a real bonding A real genuine bonding, my heart will knit to you. Uh, For an Israelite, and and I must say this, um, in ancient Israel, their view of humanity was that the heart was the seat of the will and the centre of the self. We talk about heart now like it's almost, you know, a bit airy-fairy, didn't it, you know? We, yeah? How I'm feeling today? Well, how my heart's feeling. It's that sort of feel. But actually, for an ancient Israelite, the heart was the very centre of their being. 
It was everything about them. So when David says, I am going to knit my heart to you, he says, I'm literally knitting my entire center of my very being. I'm committing so much to you if you've come here in peace. It's an act of will. It is a mental ascension to choose to be loyal and committed to a person. It's actually more than that. It's actually dying to oneself for the other. You're committing yourself to the other. So David is saying, if you've come in peace, I am committing myself to you, to serve you. Reminds you of somebody else who's a bit later on down in the heritage line of King David, isn't it? I think we've just been singing to him. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same imagery. When he says taking up your cross and following me, it's the same sense. Knitting yourself, your very centre of your being, to Jesus. Jesus, when he died on that cross for you, he knitted his very centre of his being to you. And he expects no less commitment. Expects no less commitment. In that very brief synapsis of trying to understand something. Um, Timmy, could you just go on for a little bit longer? I just want to show those large numbers of people that uh, came to follow David. You, if you read the rest of the Chronicles, these numbers go from small numbers of 3,000, which come from the tribe of Benjamin. The reason for that is because some of, obviously, Saul's family didn't go chasing after David. <laughs> and then as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger... It gets larger and larger and larger. The numbers just keep, see, it keeps getting bigger. Look, from 6,800 to 7,100. Keep going to me, thank you. 4,000, 3,000, keep going, because it gets bigger. 20,000, keep going. 18, keep going. And it gets 50,000, that's it. Stop there for a minute. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's the reason is that when you list out the tribes, geographically, they were the ones furthest away, and yet they seem to be sending more troops. I think there's one, there's 120,000 troops. Now, actually, in reality, there's no way they had that number. What the author is trying to show us is actually their commitment to David was this big. Their heart commitment to David was this big. It's like if you've gone fishing. Ever heard of fish? No, I'm not a fisherman. You know, and a fisherman goes, ah, what was the catch like? Yeah? yeah? In historical reality, it was... But it's got nothing to do with, it's to do with the actual act of catching a fish. So it feels like this because he's probably waited for hours and finally got a bite. Have I got that roughly right? I'm not a fisherman, so I wouldn't have a clue. And this is what the author's trying to show, that actually their commitment to David really was this big, their heart knitting to him was this big. So they sent all these people because they were that committed to him. So the question happens to be that when Jesus came and died on that cross, he was committed to us. Yeah? So how are we committed to Jesus? With me? Actually, I just realised that's like Jesus on the cross, isn't it? Sorry, it just dawned on me. Yeah, these moments happen occasionally. It's like Jesus on the cross, isn't he? He's committed that much. How much do we go? Do we give the worst of what's left overs, the, the bits that we don't want to Jesus? Or do we give the best? Because remember that Jesus is known as the warrior Messiah, as King David was. 
So this is the connection we're making. That's how we can pick up some stuff from Chronicles. Are you that committed to Jesus? Geographically, by the way, these 120 or 1,000, where they had to come from to get to here, it was seriously hard work. It was a hard slog. It wasn't a nice, easy stroll in the... Oh, it's summer. Look at the sun. Isn't it lovely? It was a hard slog. But they did it. And they unified behind David. And we also should unify behind Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. And our commitment should be this big. And we will see that these skilled warriors, these men, all came in verse 38, it states, All these men came in battle array to Hebron with a single purpose of making David the king over all Israel. In fact, everyone in Israel agreed that David should be their king. I took that and I really reflected on that. And I sat there and I thought, do we all come in battle array so that we come unified, so that, that Jesus is proclaimed king over Greenford, over North Old, or over wherever you live? But do we come unified in our battle array? Notice why the Chronicle is trying to show us that not one person had their own idea or their own agenda. It was all coming under King David. As a warrior group, with all their commanders and troops and all the different things that they do, but all with the sole purpose of making King David king over Israel. I ask my brothers and sisters, do we come with that single-minded focus every day to say, not for my agenda, but for God's agenda? Do I come unified recognising that Jesus is Lord and Saviour and it needs to be proclaimed and he needs to be made king over Greenford, over North Holt? Do you remember right at the beginning this morning I asked you, did you leave your baggage at the door? For those that are here. Did you leave your baggage at the door? Did you come in with that central idea to focus on God and what he wants? Are you willing to give your very best for the rest of your life to God? Notice I didn't just say the rest of this week. The rest of your life to God. To actually get behind him. So that you will, though you may be a single person, together we're a 120,000 troop. This morning, he's already blessed people. Has he not? It means his heart is knitted to yours. Have you knitted your heart back? Have you sacrificed to him? Have you given your best? We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.